Today, I'm out driving with all the fours. I'm in a Golf R, but that's a 400 horsepower Golf R with 400 foot-pan of torque and four-wheel drive. This will be fun. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. If you like your hot hatches and fast estates to be rapid but discreet, a cue cart if you will, then you are in the right place because they do not fly much further under the radar than the Golf R. Volkswagen have played the discretion game very strongly with the Golf R because to look at it's virtually no more obvious that it's a performance car than the GTI, maybe even less so, but it is seriously quick. Nearly 300 horsepower in standard form and this car has been remapped to about 400, which is quite a lot. Most people probably wouldn't give it a second look. It's got big wheels, it's got some slightly larger sills and at the back you've got some quite interesting exhaust pipes, but that's all very, very subtle stuff and most people won't give it a second glance. However, they would be wrong. This is a 2016 car, which makes it a Mark 7 Golf. There was a facelift in November 2016, which was the Mark 7.5, they call it. So most of the bodywork, the panels, is all pretty much standard stuff, but you do get this big bumper, much deeper, with these big air intakes, this lower splitter, the satin metal and the rubber below, or paint actually. And of course you get the bi-zone on headlights with the LED running lights, which I think is standard on the higher level cars anyway. The only giveaway at the front really, apart from this little splitter down here, is this tiny little R. Around the back, again, there's virtually nothing to give it away. You've got a little R here in the corner, and of course you've got the four tailpipes. Well, car nerds, car spotters will see it straight away, but the general public won't know you're in something incredibly fast again. This car has actually had an upgrade. It's got a full Scorpion exhaust system on it. And uh, to finish things off, it's got these genuine, almost real Acropovic exhaust finishes in what may well be carbon. But of course, this is an estate car, so it's the useful one of the family. Of course, you can have this as a hatchback, but personally, I prefer a rapid estate car. Pull back this load cover, which actually stops halfway back if you wanted to, to give ease of access and you know, general flexibility of use. And you've got a massive boot, over 1,600 litres of space with the seats folded down. It's kind of equivalent to a 5 Series BMW in a car, which is significantly smaller on the outside. It's loading up at the moment, my cameras, boxes of luggage, a bag of stuff, a spare tyre, and this is just some of the stuff I found in the car when I picked it up a few minutes ago. So you have this great big floor space here which sits flush with the load lip which can make loading very easy indeed. Another advantage of the estate car is the fact you can specify a space saver spare tyre. If you choose the premium audio with the subwoofer, it gets a subwoofer in the spare wheel. So if you do have a flat somewhere in the wild of beyond, then you're not going to be stranded with a useless inflaty kit which doesn't actually work. This car's actually just had a massive upgrade with a Helix subwoofer in it, which I imagine sounds incredibly good. Now to gain access to the uh, massive area of load space if you wanted to, there are handles left and right with luggage hooks next to them as well. Pull that handle and the seat flies forward. It's a 60-40 split and of course you can take the load space cover out if you need to carry a washing machine or a wardrobe home. Now, as standard, this 2.0-litre turbo makes 300-ish horsepower, 296 to be exact. Now, this car, though, has had a few little updates. This is the Revo Carbon Fiber Ram Air Intake, which makes air funnel much more rapidly into the standard airbox, which has got the Revo air filter in it, which then goes through this bigger Revo pipe here. You can just about make out stuff down here. It's got a Revo intercooler and a Revo Stage 2 ECU tune. So the thing's making around 400 horsepower and 400 foot-pound of torque. And the exhaust gases are exiting via a Scorpion downpipe to a Scorpion sports exhaust and a Scorpion catback system, going to those acrophobic-ish tips which you saw at the back of the car a second ago. So yeah, all in all, a decent setup here. And to make that a bit more manageable for the four-wheel drive, system it's got a Revo TCU's remap on the gearbox as well now even before all of this extra work uh, took place this engine the EA888 was already heavily reworked from the GTI to the R models uh, it had been reworked different springs all kinds of different stuff going on inside there to give it the about an extra 40 horsepower over the now for a performance car 
This interior is really comfy. These bucket seats are obviously very, very buckety. They come right up around the side of your legs and sort of hold you tightly in place. And likewise, these kind of arms at the side of the back of the seat rest do the same for your body. So you can't really rock out and fall out of the chair in hard cornering, but they're also very nicely soft and squishy, really comfy. So you are always very, very ah, relaxed. Now, although this car shares its architecture with you know, the Seat, the Skoda, the uh, Audi, all sort of using the same under the skin stuff, they've all got their own individual characters and the Golf is possibly the most sensible, if you like. It all feels really well put together, but you don't get that same kind of, I don't know, sparkle you get with the Seat in the Cooper, for example. There is a very German serious feel about the way everything's laid out. Looking at the color scheme in here, it's all very heavily in the black and silver tones. Even the headlining on this car is black because sports car. Looking around the car, starting on the door, we've got our little carbon fiber trim accents, which is repeated over here above the glove box with a little satin silver line insert matching the satin silver door handle. And if you look closely, there's actually a full length white or bluey white line running along the bottom of that, giving a little touch of excitement and visual interest. In fact, when you open the door, the satin metal door tread has got the matching little blue line in there. So when you open the door, it kind of accents it as you step in. Ahead of the metal door handle, the door locks and the electric mirror switches folding in and heated. So many options. Those mirrors actually are also carbon fiber shelled, which is a massively expensive option from new. Although the armrest and door card are a nice padded black leather, the door pull, which you think might be leather, is actually a hard wearing plastic with, again, more satin metal there sense to kind of liven the interior up and you know four electric window switches are all tucked away behind there as well down in the bottom of the door there is a huge padded door bin uh, i don't say pocket i'm gonna say bin because it is massive there's room for like a standing up bottle of drink it goes all the way back here there's room for a ton of things in there moving over into this dashboard area this is a large t-shelf oh a surprisingly big t-shelf it's not quite tall enough or it's just tall enough to put your Furious mug on there. I've got a dent in the Furious cup. I don't know what I did that on. So yeah, you know, various cups. Plenty of room for snacking opportunities up here on the dashboard. And they've uh, tried to liven up this big slab of black plastic with this kind of zigzag curving around the instrument binnacle, uh, just an indent, just to you know, create some visual interest swooping across the top of the dashboard. And the dials are quite interesting. It's been noted on uh, various reviews of this car, it's got blue needles because R and fun and exciting, which against the white outer ring of the dials does look quite exciting. Uh, but I've been told or have read in a couple of reviews that that makes it a bit hard to read at night when you've got the main beam headlights on for some reason. But as it's uh, relatively bright today, I'm not sure I'll find out exactly what that situation is like. Like. On this generation, it's still an analog dashboard. So we've got two big dials, rev counter on the left, red lining at six and a half, going all the way to just over 8,000 8, RPM. And then on the right hand side, the speedo, which goes up to 200 miles an hour. And that's not that wildly optimistic. A lot of these cars were limited to 155. Uh, standard cars were known to have done around 167. And this one with the 400 BHP has estimated to be around 180 so you know that's that could be using most of that dial if you really wanted to and both those little dials have got a tiny sub dial in the bottom center one on the left for the temperature of the engine water and on the right for the fuel and in the center we've got a nice useful lcd like a fully graphic screen that can print up pictures and all kinds of other stuff so all your online data that you could possibly need is in there now moving back we've got our two stalks indicators and flashes on the left and of course wipers on the right and moving back before we get to the steering wheel we've got flappy paddles but these are not the standard ones these have been upgraded for some rather fun racing line metal ones which feel a bit nicer than the standard plastic items which don't feel that nice under your fingers these though feel like proper sort of racing machine items then we get to the steering wheel this is one of the few clues that you're in a properly fast car apart from these sort of bucket seats this flat bottom r steering wheel chunky with kind of racing wheel grips it's a proper sports car steering wheel in the center obviously airbag and horn um, horn test oh that's piercing that's a, a ripe horn ready to go now um all over the festooned i'm going to say across the steering wheel are lots of buttons left hand side is pretty much entirely cruise control now along with bison on headlights emergency low speed brake assist and led tail lights and daylight running lights the r model also got adaptive cruise which is a weird thing which follows the speed of the car in front which takes some getting used to but is incredibly nice once you're once you've got used to it on the motorway that's 
all on the left hand side of the steering wheel. On the right hand side, cluster of buttons. There is volume, radio, phone, and menu items. It's a, a two, four, six, eight. There are nine buttons on each side of the steering wheel. There's an 18 button steering wheel plus horn. So 19 buttons on the wheel. That's a lot going on on a racing wheel. You're talking Formula One territory there. Now over to the left of this whole area here, we have got a big slab of a console. It's all very dark, very big. It actually makes the interior feel a little bit small actually because of the way it all kind of wraps around you. Now this car originally came with a six and a half inch non sat nav um, screen system, uh, but it's just been upgraded to the later 7.5, a Golf 7.5, eight inch glass touch screen, which is absolutely beautiful and fills this dashboard entirely. Uh, gives you sat nav, DAB, full color, oh, just a magical thing. And by adding this new eight inch touch screen, we also get a reversing camera. Underneath that, we've got our dual zone climate, all our other temperature controls, heated seats for the, both front seat passengers. A lot of functions distilled into a few buttons. This is a nice bit of design because unlike some designs which are just covered in buttons, it's just an absolute mess and you can't find where you're going, or full screen systems, which are equally confusing because you have so many submenus. This is a nice clear system where everything you need is here in front of you, not confusingly laid out. It's a, it's a nice bit of design for that heated control area just there. And moving down, we've got a nice more piano black stuff. This one says four motion to remind you you are in the all wheel drive version of the car. Underneath that, we've got a great big cubby hole, which goes back a surprisingly long way. And behind that, we've got more buttons. And of course the DSG shifter. This car has got the six speed DSG, the only option on the estate. The five door hatch was available with a six speed manual, which personally I prefer, or the DSG. The estate only came with DSG. Around it, we've got a, got a couple more buttons, got the mode button for the transmission, got the auto start, stop off, and of course, traction control off. And moving back, got a couple more buttons, got the electronic parking brake. I'm never a fan of these, but when you're using, they're kind of integrated these days, so you're kind of stuck with them. And it's also got automatic hill hold on, on a second button, so you can turn it off and on. And next to that, behind it, you do have a tiny, tiny, tiny cubby, which I think may be intended for the key, but it's a funny shape, and a lighter socket for 12 volts underneath this little roll desktop thing. You have two cup holders, and unlike in the Leon, they're both the same size, so you can put your cup front or back, wherever you desire, so excellent tea shelf, tea cuppery going on there. Hurrah! There's an armrest in the middle, leather topped and padded, and that lifts up to a nice big cubby hole in the centre, useful and practical. And finally in the front, we've got a little battery of controls up here for your reading lights, interior lights. And of course, this car has got the full length panoramic sunroof, which is a lovely option to have. It adds a bit of weight to the top of the car, but not too much to worry about in most general driving, unless you're taking it on the track a lot, that's not an issue. And it does make the car feel much lighter, much airier. Nice to have. So a quick look in the back and then take it for a drive. Oops, ah, who left that there? Now the interior, space in the back is remarkably generous for a car in this kind of mid-size category. Of course, it's a Golf, so it's smaller than an E-Class, but the back seat room is amazing. You've got tons of knee room, you've got tons of shin room, your feet aren't squished under the chairs, you've got loads of headroom, even with the lower headlining you get with this glass roof, you've still got decent headroom. A nice armrest, padded and leathery like in the front, uh, double speakers, tweeter and mid-range here in the door, and even air vents in the centre, so you can have nice warm or cool air flowing into the back of the car. It's the same kind of hard wearing material with little Alcantara inserts as you get in the front. The fronts have got this lovely R oh, embroidery in the back. So nothing going on in the back seats though. But we do have a nice big armrest and softly padded, very nice. And it's got cup holders which are adjustable manually, but still adjustable so you can go from a little tiny bottle of water to a big a kid's sippy cup to a mug of I don't know what. So useful, practical, adjustable, very clever. And there's even a ski hatch through to the boot. There's a couple of nice extra touches as well. For example, these little reading lights above the B posts left and right. And these coat hooks just above here as well. So they don't hang annoyingly across the window quite so much and flap around and be irritating if you've got a, a jacket hanging up there. Now, driving this car is simplicity itself. It's a DSG gearbox, so obviously it's an automatic, basically, so stick it in D, off it goes. And there are people who may question why you want four-wheel drive in a standard size hatchback. What's the point? But it's about putting the power down, as well as stability and fast corners and fast driving. When you're out and about in everyday driving, when you're at a difficult junction trying to get away, or maybe on a not great surface, it really does make a huge difference. It's no 
surprise to say the performance is brisk on this car. I mean, 0 to 60 as standard. 5.1 for the manual, about 4.8 for the, for the auto. Apparently it's about 3.8 approximately with the uh, work that's been done to this car. Something I'm noticing straight away is one more little tuning add-on which has been done to this car. Hidden down in the pistol pocket under the steering wheel is a little extra controller. And this takes out, well this controls I should say, the, um, the throttle response. So you can take out those couple of centimetres of dead space at the top of the pedal travel. So the moment you brush the throttle it starts to accelerate. It's not only is it good when you're driving, if you're sat in a traffic jam, you can just brush the throttle and wake the car up effectively from the uh, auto start-stop system. Now as standard, these came with 18-inch rims. This car though has got the optional 19s. Now at the time, uh, journalists were saying if you're going to go for the 19s, you really do need to go and get the dynamic chassis control system installed as well, uh, which is a, you know, a couple of thousand more pounds than uh, you would otherwise be paying. The uh, person who spec'd this car, I think it was actually a demonstrator for a Volkswagen dealership and belonged to the dealer principal or was used by the dealer principal, so it was very loaded indeed, but they, I guess, knew the cars pretty well and didn't choose to spec that particular option, so, so that may say something a bit telling about the, uh, the dynamic chassis control system if the uh, dealer principal could have had it and didn't have it. He chose carbon fibre wing mirrors instead, and a sunroof. But to be perfectly honest, on all but the worst road, the standard springs are more than adequate. Okay, getting into, uh, from a 50 to a 70. Okay, that was 70 already, that's, that's quite quick really. All right, let's get to a twisty road, more fun than a dual carriageway. Now in terms of rivals, the hatchback has got more to worry about than the estate. That's got things like the M135 from BMW, the Focus RS, that kind of stuff to contend with, as potential buyers might be considering them as well. But when you get to the estate version, there's, there's less competition. There's the, um, the Focus ST estate, but that's not really quite in the same class as this. And so surprisingly, its closest rivals come from elsewhere within the VW group. The Seat Leon Cupra, obviously, and of course from Audi, the uh, RS3 versions. But they've all got their own very different take. I mean, as we know, it's clever badge engineering because it's the same car underneath. If you climb from one to another, you'll recognize the same switch gear, the same dials down here, the same sat-nav and infotainment systems all look virtually the same, because they are. But they, the different spin they put on the cars makes them very different. This, this car feels way more sensible and grown up than the Seat did. The Seat felt like it was fun and silly. There's something about the way the dashboard was designed. It's also interesting as a halo car because you've really got to want that bit more poke quite a lot because it's about £5,000 more than a GTI, but only about 40 more bhp but then you do get so much more equipment and the cachet as well of having the R. Right, now we're on some twisty bits. Let's talk about the transmission. Okay, obviously you have the choice of a DSG or a DSG. It's okay, as DSGs go, it's a very good one. It's a six speed, it flips to the gears fast as you like, it's very, very swift and subtle, and it gives you an amazing time around the Nürburgring, yay. But generally we're not on the Nürburgring, and I prefer a little bit more interaction with the manual gearbox, but the thing is, when you get to 400 horsepower, as the owner says, you are shifting just a bit too much and he kind of prefers it. So, yeah, so be it. However, th that's not the exciting thing on this car. This car is four-wheel drive, or all-wheel drive, if you want to be technical. It uses a Haldex differential in the centre, which means that most of the time, in ordinary driving, you are on front-wheel drive, which is great and sensible and useful and fuel-efficient. But, even before the back wheels start to slip, somehow it knows, and it's Slips power up to 100% of the power, in fact, to the back wheels. So this car, as it's pushing through in difficult uh, conditions, tricky turns and manoeuvres, it can be all-wheel drive, it can be front-wheel drive, it can be one-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive. It's an amazingly clever system which makes the car astonishingly sure-footed and very handy in a corner. Now, day to day use, the standard non-dynamic chassis control suspension is absolutely fine. We've got speed bumps here, and it creeps over them quite happily. But then, chuck it hard into a corner, here's a roundabout. Car leans a little, 
there's about another 70 kilos in the estate version over the hatchback but the car just leans a little and grips and goes I'll take you back to a dual carriageway because there's then we can do a 0 to 60 and you can hear and the sound of this Scorpion exhaust and the shifting of this DSG now that's a truck and a half right let's wait for a gap in the traffic and away we go okay okay three two one go whoa 43 before we got to the other side of the roundabout that is just nuts that's that's 400 horsepower for you and all that in a car which is basically a practical family hauler if you've got to shift stuff go on a road trip and this is quite interesting for me because around the time this car came out I actually drove a number of Cupra's and Leon STs as kind of long-term press car loans and uh, yes I've driven most of the variants of this car under the Sayak guys but, but I'm not quite so familiar with the Golf R version of the, no, the car is basically based on and it's always interesting how the Cupra went from a 280 to a 290 to a 300 horsepower and they kept on upping the power gradually but it was never quite allowed to go as much as the Golf because that was the halo model of the range and as a family car it was fantastic I drove the Seat version of this car down the Stelvio Pass loaded with family gear a complete boot full of you know, camping and holiday stuff and child seats in the back so not only is it a massively exciting fun car it's also enormously practical and the thing is it looks good too it's very subtle very understated as i've already said but it's an elegant car those big sort of d pillars look quite quite nice they give it a nice bit of character it kind of flows the, the shape of the car flows interestingly it's in general a nice piece of design one rather fun little button here by the gear shift is this one with a mode button on it it goes from eco to normal to a race when you really can pick up your heels ridiculously it changes the shift dynamics the shift positions holds it in a much lower gear for longer so you can really enjoy the car now one nice thing with the DSG you don't go the manual is the program downshift paddle blips it'll pop some bangs <laughs> we are children after all Thank you for joining me today i hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this rather special just very very subtly tuned and very subtly subtle golf r um, it's a spectacular machine so so under the radar and yet so powerful and so full of potential and usefulness if you've enjoyed this please hit like and subscribe as always it makes a huge difference to it makes a huge difference to the channel and join me again next time driving something completely different